Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming to this uh, meeting and to this session. I'm talking about the fertility of Tibetan women at high altitude. And I'm talking about uh, it for uh, a slightly different reason than understanding fertility per se. The uh, data are the result of a collaborative international project including uh, cultural anthropologists such as Sienna Craig on the left, uh, all of these research assistants from uh, Tibetans from Nepal, a population geneticist from the University of Chicago, statisticians, and so forth. And, uh, and over 1,000 uh, post-reproductive Tibetan women. And the reason that I'm interested in uh, fertility is because I'm interested in adaptations. And we've been using these terms throughout these meetings. You know, this is an evolved adaptation. This is an adaptation. Uh, this signal of selection indicates we've got adaptation. And I would like us to pause and think, how do we know whether or not something is an evolved adaptation? What is the evidence that we might like to have in order to make that assertion? We spend a lot of time in class talking about adaptation and natural selection. If you're a student, you've heard people talk about this a lot. Uh, this is how we understand how organisms function, by referring to adaptation and natural selection. In evolutionary medicine, this is one of the ways that we think about how uh, we may malfunction and maybe get sick. And you all know the model, we need a stressful environment, we need a phenotypic variation, and so forth. What I'd like to do is give you an example, a beautiful example, of uh, <laughs> Tibetan adaptation to high altitude hypoxia. And uh, then uh, to raise this question again, how do we know an adaptation when we see one? And as this was, done at high altitudes in Nepal. This is uh, near Mount Manaslu in, in central Nepal. There is, in this case, a clear environmental stressor. It's hypoxia, less than the normal amount of oxygen in the air and in the blood. And there are a number of features of high altitude hypoxia that make it a really nice stress to study. One, it's big and it's quantifiable. For example, uh, this is a graph of the partial pressure of inspired oxygen, both the absolute numbers in uh, blue and the relative per percent relative to sea level So let's in, uh, in orange. So let's look at that. Uh, the people that I'm going to talk about live between 3,000 and about 4,200 meters. And at those altitudes, every lungful of air has only about 60% of the oxygen molecules that we have here. Now that is a stress because all of our mitochondria, many of bio biochemical reactions, require a constant supply of oxygen. Another beauty of hypoxia is that it's constant throughout the year, it's constant from year to year, morning, noon, and night, young and old, rich and poor, you can't escape it. Um, so that makes it good, <laughs> from my standpoint anyway. Uh, a second element of our model of, uh, of adaptation and natural selection is uh, that individuals in our population need to vary phenotypically. And uh, here we are collecting data on phenotypic variation. Uh, these women that are being interviewed by the research assistants are uh, vary in the number of kids they have. They vary in whether or not they are still fertile. They vary in their hemoglobin concentrations. And what we're interested in is, well, OK, can we fit this into the model of evolution and adaptation? I'm going to focus on hemoglobin concentration. And this is, a, uh, this is a, the result of measuring hemoglobin in these 1,000 women. And there are a couple of things to look at in this plot. One is that altitude is along the x-axis, and there is no increase 
in hemoglobin concentration with altitude as high as 4,100 meters. That's about 13,000 feet. Second is that there's enormous phenotypic variation at all altitudes. The gray lines there represent the uh, upper and lower uh, range of normal variation here at, at low altitude in the US. And the Tibetan's average of 13.9 is smack dab in the middle of that. That's intra-population. How about inter-population variation? Tibetans respond differently hematologically than Andean Highlanders. And I focused here on two studies that were both explicitly comparative. Uh, Bob Winslow's uh, two points are here on the left. He went to Nepal and he went to Chile and measured at the same altitude using the same equipment, the same exclusion criteria, inclusion criteria. And as you can see, at the same altitude, Andean Highlanders have a little more than a gram more hemoglobin concentration than Tibetans at the same altitude. A few years later, I did the same thing. I went to, in this case, I went to Bolivia and to the Tibet Autonomous Region and I measured hundreds of uh, people and got the same result. Uh, even more dramatically, there's a three grams of hemoglobin difference between the Andean Highlanders and the Tibetan Highlanders. In this case, we're looking at males, and the gray lines are the uh, normal range of variation here at sea level for men. The time was the mid to late 90s, before the Human Genome Project, and we simply had did not have the techniques uh, to identify specific genes and specific loci. So what we did instead was use quantitative genetics based on collection of pedigrees to estimate heritability. And our aim in estimating heritability was to ask the simple question, is there potential for natural selection to be acting in these populations? And as you can see, there was high heritability in both populations. There's potential for natural selection in both populations. It wasn't until quite a bit later that genomics finally came to high altitude. And uh, this represents, this Manhattan plot represents a comparison of allele frequency differences. This is not an GWAS, an association plot. It's, a measure, it's measures of allele frequency differences, comparing high altitude Tibetans to their likely ancestors as represented by uh, modern Han Chinese. And above the line, above the red line, are the SNPs that were uh, after bone for only correction for multiple comparisons. These are the, the uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms that were, showed significant differences. And there has never been a more lovely uh, result, may I say. <laughs> when I saw <laughs> EPAS1, I was delighted. And the reason is, is that EPAS1 plays a key role in oxygen homeostasis. And I'll just give you an abbreviated uh, sense of the oxygen homeostasis cellular pathway. Here, there, is, uh, there are oxygen sensors. They're coded for by a locus called Eglin-1. There are a set of transcription factors. Uh, there's a subunit coded for by EPAS-1. Uh, that contributes to a transcription factor called hypoxia-inducible factor 2. And that transcription factor has many, many target genes, one of which is particularly interesting because it is erythropoietin. And when we go to high altitude, uh, Eglin senses hypoxia, it, uh, EPAS1 and uh, HIF2 increase, EPO increases, and we make more hemoglobin. So this was really beautiful because it, it made sense. Furthermore, the Tibetan alleles associate with lower hemoglobin concentration. And this has been replicated now five times in five different samples. 
The Tibetan women I'm talking about today are a sixth replication. The people who are, the women or the men who are homozygous for Tibetan, uh, the high in Tibetan alleles have lower hemoglobin concentration. So this partly explains their lower hemoglobins than Andean Highlanders. The Tibetan alleles increase with altitude. Importantly, they have not reached fixation though. Therefore, that means that there's genetic variation that we can use to look at to see if natural selection is still working. So let's ask this question. Do Tibetan women with genotypes for low hemoglobin concentration have more children? We asked that question by getting reproductive histories, hemoglobin levels from over 1,000 women who had completed their reproductive careers. And our fundamental question was, uh, do they have more kids, more surviving children? Stress is the same. Variation in phenotype is the same. The association of hemoglobin with EPAS1 is the same uh, as we would expect. It, it fits all our models and uh, replicates what I explained earlier. What about uh, measures of reproductive success? Well, here we've got uh, a distribution of the number of pregnancies, anywhere from 0 to 15. Uh, for reproductive success, though, we'd really like to have a uh, number of uh, children, offspring, surviving to adulthood. And this is often measured in terms of children surviving to 15. And that also varied from 0 to 10. So let's keep looking and see what the relationship is between genotype and survival. Well, we also have to take into account a number of other factors, because we all know that a fertility and offspring survival is a function of so many factors, including things that we think of as remote influences, your, you know, whether or not you're married, have a stable marriage, and uh, what your marital status is. And all of those, here's some noise, whether your marriage uh, was stable or not, influences the number of kids. How many miscarriages you had influences the number of kids. How many children, uh, how many, are you rich? Are you come from a rich household? The difference is between almost five kids and, and a little under three. Now, we ran Poisson regressions on these analyses in, in taking into account hemoglobin concentration along with all of these noise variables. And the noise variables can explain more than 60% of the variance in reproductive success. Um, EPAS-1 can explain about 5% of the variance in hemoglobin. And there is a, uh, a marginal correlation between hemoglobin concentration and uh, the number of kids that, who survive to, uh, to reproductive age. So my question to you is, is this evidence that hemoglobin concentration is an adaptation? EPAS-1 SNPs themselves do not associate with reproductive success. They do associate with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has a marginal association with reproductive success. Can we call this an adaptation? You know, we've got a lot of the elements of adaptation as a result of natural selection. Do we have enough? And I'm asking this question because we really need to think about the criteria for deciding what is an evolved adaptation? We like to say that there's a mismatch between evolved adaptation and our, our current environment, for example. That's a common evolutionary explanation for uh, differences uh, for why we're vulnerable to illness. And it's this emphasis on adaptation in evolutionary medicine that I think makes it so important for us to really face head on how are we going to demonstrate what is an evolved adaptation? Thank you very much for your attention.